Hi everybody, this is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the persons appearing on the program. Today on Rainbow Country, novelist and screenwriter Melanie Mesner joins me to talk about her latest novel, Slow Reveal, a novel about art, the creative process, adultery, sexuality, and more. Plus an artist spotlight on American indie rock group, Ships Have Sailed. All that and more on episode 303, so stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, this is Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls. Hey everyone, this is Chris Harder, porn star, burlesque performer, and the creator of Porn to Be a Star. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Well, hello and welcome to a brand new journey through Rainbow Country. As I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT FM in Toronto and now proudly in syndication on 12 outlets across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. The Yukon, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, Ontario, even down to Buffalo, New York, and online. Well, thanks to you tuning in, streaming, downloading, but ultimately, listening. Together, we continue to build Rainbow Country into a nationally syndicated gay radio show, a number one LGBT podcast on Podomatic.com's Gay and Lesbian Chart, as well as being recognized as Canada's number two LGBT podcast on Feedspot.com. So, today, author and screenwriter Melanie Mesner joins me to talk about her latest novel, Slow Reveal, a novel about a lesbian affair, emotional infidelity, addiction, and the creative process. And later on in the show, an artist spotlight on American indie rock group Ships Have Sailed. I'll be chatting with founder Will Carpenter about their 2022 album, Ages, which peaked at number nine on the U.S. alternative iTunes charts. Plus an hour two, music from LGBT artists, independent artists, voices that we've come to know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. And on this episode, I'm featuring some classic 80s, some Gino Vanelli, as well as some jazz and electronic. All that lies ahead as we start this little gay journey through Rainbow Country. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing. Based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill. But without some progressive conservative legislators backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four, I'm former Cabinet Minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. Hi, I'm writer Adam Smith, author of Deep Sniff, A History of Poppers and Queer Futures. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Cast 
Catherine, a film editor, ends her decade-long affair with Naomi, a lesbian poet. To reconcile with her husband, Jonathan, and repair relations with her daughters, Ellie, an artist, and Bridget, an aspiring writer mired in addiction. Up next, novelist and screenwriter Melanie Mesner starts off our interview with a reading from her novel, Slow Reveal. Naomi drifted off to the dark well of longing for those snowy nights in East Marion, where she paced, reciting her work to Catherine, before ravishing her on the living room floor as the last of the embers in the fireplace extinguished. Shut out from the rest of their lives, shut down, yet gloriously open to the moment, which lingered on endlessly, as though the entirety of their existence were encapsulated in a single instant. She left the reading at St. Mark's Church, crossed Avenue A near First, spotted a phone booth and stopped. In the short space of time she could talk herself out of the urgency, she stepped up to the receiver. Catherine answered, but at first she didn't hear Naomi's voice over the din of traffic. It's me. I'm out on the street in the East Village, she said. Something wrong? I haven't heard from you. Not that you're under any obligation to stay in touch, but I want to be there for you, Katie. Be there in a way that might be, I don't know, beneficial. You sound like a doctor. Naomi realized how calculating she was, the way passion shape changed into need, then shape changed into something more desperate, a false narrative projected onto the object of desire in the form of support. One thing she knew for sure, woman when faced with another woman could not escape the truth. I wanted to check on you. I'm all right, I guess. I don't know. Catherine moved through her uncorrupted. Okay, I'll admit it. I needed to hear your voice. Look, I have to go, Catherine said. She was on the floor of the walk-in, surrounded by small paintings on paper. I'm making an inventory of Jonathan's work, you know, for his retrospective. Why did she have to mention him? Here she was, trapped by the longing caught in the net, snared, while Catherine was back in the closet, comforted by a ghost, the part of Jonathan she loved and admired, the legacy he left behind. Death was a form of black magic, the way it clutched survivors in its grip. All mortal acts attained a kind of immortality through the recognition by others, the dying mortal, but the death immortalized, the artist mortal, but the art immortalized. This act we call life, the very definition of mortality, immortalized through every appeal, every retreat, every request, and every confession. What arrogance, the very idea that Catherine's function was to serve her own, as if all relationships serve that purpose. Something was seriously wrong with that line of reasoning, passionless and bloody. Naomi didn't like messes she couldn't clean up with her deft handling of language. Had she viewed their relationship as immortal, as if it would never perish? Or was she busy building a security force to hide behind, an armed one to keep out intruders, especially dead ones? She looked at the sign van and block letters written across the shop window. Racks of French and Italian wines lined the floor to ceiling walls. She remembered that unctuous coat roti after cycling 36 miles around the fluvial terraces of the Rhone Valley what seemed like a million summers ago. Two weeks of uninterrupted bliss, riding hard by day against the bleached out sun, grapes glistening on the vines, that year producing a superior vintage. Basking in the eerie glow of candelabras and castles en route, where they dined in cellars and slept in medieval rooms with stone fireplaces. On one particular stormy night, the last one of their trip, they huddled in front of a roaring fire and Catherine admitted she was missing Jonathan, that she didn't feel free of him, that he was ingrained in her like a genetic imprint. Devastated by her confession, Naomi hoped she wouldn't hear the same lamentation recounted over a candlelit dinner, this time at her loft, that is, if ever they were reunited. She was feeling possessive. If she didn't protect the relationship, no one would. Seduced by love, then slaughtered by it. 
that's how she envisioned the outcome if she allowed herself to go that far. Melanie Metzner, hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I am well. Thank you for being here to have your voice, your story be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you for that, especially to talk about Slow Reveal. This is your latest novel, but I want to start here with yourself. You are based in Montreal. Yes, based in Montreal. Um, I came in 2009 to help my partner care for her uh, family and been there ever since. <laughs> mm. And your partner is a visual artist, gender queer, I believe. Uh, yes, yes. Mickey Gorney? Right, that's right. And you moved to Montreal from from where? New York City? Uh, not the city. We, we were in the city for many years, but we're on the very east end of Long Island on the North Fork, which is the opposite uh, fork of the, of, uh, you know, across from the Hamptons. And you moved from there to Montreal. Yes. Must be love. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was love and duty, both. <laughs> So fat, we're talking about family, we're talking about art, we're talking about the creative process. This is essentially your latest novel, Slow Reveal. Talk to me about this novel and the story. What is the story that you're essentially telling in Slow Reveal? Well, it, it's set in New York in the 90s, and it's about a family of artists who defy the arbiters of culture and they challenge social norms. Um, in an open marriage, Catherine a film editor, meets Naomi, a lesbian poet, and they have a 10-year on-off affair, at which time um, Catherine's struggling to maintain both relationships. So she decides to try and reconcile her marriage and deal with her two grown daughters, a visual artist and uh, an aspiring writer mired in addiction. Um, But things don't go as planned. (laughs) So you just mentioned it, uh, Slow Reveal, dealing with topics like the creative process, family, family dynamics, uh, addiction, uh, Mm -hmm. sexuality, maybe bisexuality, lesbianism, adultery, pretty interesting and uh, juicy topics to to base uh, a story on. So here's the question, what made you decide to tell this particular story with these with these particular issues what inspired this well you know a, a couple of things i you know aside from the fact that i i tend to write a lot about family dynamics and family dysfunction because i think it's endlessly fascinating and we never really um square our experience with our expectations when it comes to family. Um, And I always like to write about creative characters. But in this case, I really wanted to draw a parallel between the artistic process and building intimacy and trust and love because they're very similar in a way. They're both very risky. They're unpredictable. And, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of uh, determination and a lot of times the devote devotion and commitment aren't the guardrails that keep a work or a relationship on track. They can be a form of entrapment actually. So, you know, I, I wanted to look at those two um, paths in my narrative and, and see where they intersect. And that's how I came to write this work. Set in 1990s, New York city. Yep. Uh, New York City, 1990s. Why this time period in for New York City? Well, you know, I, I lived there from the late 70s to the mid 90s. And I felt that in the early to mid 90s, New York was going through a transition. You know, we were losing. That's when big box stores came in and things became more commercial. And the East Village was invaded by Wall Street people. And, you know, it really changed. So I kind of wanted to capture it right before it changed, and um, and and that's why I decided to set it at that time. Mm. So, Catherine, a film editor, she's married. She has two grown daughters, Ellie and Bridget. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's also been in a a 
10 year you mentioned it on and off affair with Naomi the -hmm. plot thickens I I would say Mm -hmm. Uh, they often say write what you know Melanie they often say write what you know Mm -hmm. how much of you is in slow reveal it's not as much as people may believe (laughs) um Here's the thing. Uh, so the plot I doesn't pick in? <laughs> <laughs> well, it does, but in a different direction. It's, it's almost the opposite direction because um, it, it's not my life because I've never had any children. I'm, I'm the youngest in my family, so I've never even had to sort of raise anybody or, you know, be a support in that, sit, in that um, role. Um, and But what did happen to me is um, I was in – we, my partner, Nikki, was and I were both in long relationships. We met at the new school, both taking a course called Unblocking the Creative Process and uh, by an opera singer. It was pretty fascinating. And she made us do these really uncomfortable exercises. So Nikki and I were sitting next to each other, and we had to, like, look at, you know, maintain eye contact for a certain period of time and do all these things that made us really crazy. So we, but we realized we both lived in the East Village, so we started walking home together. We became best art friends, and we were, it was a platonic relationship. We were the last to know. We, we were friends for 10 years. Um, and, you know, but the trust issue, I mean, the trust was very deep between us. Um, and then one New Year's Eve, I ended up on the wrong side of the table, or maybe the right side of the table. Um, at a restaurant with Nikki, and that's we never looked back after that. It changed completely our relationship. So it's not like I had a ten-year-old affair. <laughs> it's more, you know, <laughs> it's quite the opposite. But um, I was married at the time when that happened mm-hmm. to a man. Mm-hmm. So m- my understanding is that you like to give your characters history. You like to write out like their past and mm-hmm. all that sort of good stuff. Give them like uh, some some depth to to who they are. So in the process of doing that, do you find that these characters take on a life of their own? Because I often ask this question to writers, to fellow writers uh, mm-hmm. like yourself. Do they take on a life of their own and do they start telling you how to tell their story? And did that happen for you in Slow Reveal? Um, absolutely, they take on a life of their own. And I mean, the thing is, what, what people may not realize is you have to do a lot of work to get to that point um, where you, you build an intimate relationship with them by mining their, the depths of their character and their history, and then they take over. And if they don't take over, there's not a lot of authenticity in the work. So it's, it, you know, it's kind of a necessity in order to, to write something that, you know, I feel is, has impact. Um, and, and they do. They dictate what they want, where they want to go, how it's going to come about. Um, it's not always clear, just like it isn't clear in life, you know, a relationship and what the other person wants and what they need. Um, So uh, it's not a linear path, but absolutely they dictate Mm -hmm. what happens in the novel. I find this a creative title, Slow Reveal. Talk to me. Is there a story behind why you chose this title and what is that story? Well, um, I chose it because it's, it's actually a, a film term, um, you know, a reveal in a film, you know, you track towards something or pull back and, or it's out of focus and it comes into focus. And I chose that title because I feel that's the way that truth reveals itself slowly, even though we were very aware of, of um, reality and the truth, we don't accept it. So I, I thought slow reveal was an appropriate title. And for yourself, who would you say is the the audience for for slow reveal? Well, you know, I I, I don't like to pigeonhole uh, my work, but you know, I guess that's the way of you know um, marketing goes. But you know, it's absolutely for LGBTQ plus uh, market. But I, I I think also it's it could it, it addresses parenting. It, it addresses. 
uh, marriage. It, you know, it, it covers a lot of territory. So I, I think people who are interested in uh, family dynamics, whether, you know, who are interested in art, because actually I haven't really devoted in this conversation yet how much that plays a role in the novel, but the artistic process, if you're, you know, people have a, they don't really understand what's involved in that if they're not artists. Um, they think it's, uh, they think about it as uh, something fun, like a hobby, something to look forward to, or something that you would do for leisure, when in fact it's quite, agonizing on a lot of levels so um you know somebody that would be interested in learning more about that as well and on that note we will return after this rainbow country update hi i'm garrett conley author of boy erased a memoir you're listening to rainbow country with mark tara Canada's LGBTQ2 Plus Archives just released Out North, an archive of queer activism and kinship in Canada. Order a copy from your local bookstore to dive into hundreds of loud and proud stories and photos of historical queer life in Canada from pre-1939 to today. Get your copy from your local bookstore. Out North, an archive of queer activism and kinship in Canada. Hi, I'm Joey Lamar, best-selling author of Mambo Lips and Salsa Hips, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. So you have a Bachelor of Arts in French drama? <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is going to sound like an, a dumb question, but what is French drama compared to um, drama drama? Well, it's it's French playwrights. And, um, mm. you know, so it, it's basically I, I studied French and... Um, and I, and I really wanted to, to study the playwrights and the plays. And, and so that's, you know, theater basically. Yeah. So poetry, novels, screenplays. Uh, yeah. Grow, I move grow, around. <laughs> you do. Yeah. Growing up, did you want to be a writer? Always. I, mm. you know, from a very young age, that was, I was compelled to do that. Yeah. And did you start off writing poetry when you were younger? Um, I did do that, but I also started off with short stories. They were very short when I was young, but, um, yeah, they, it, it's, I started off with short fiction, um, and then poetry and the screenplays. That was an interesting path for me. I, I kind of, I mean, I love film and stuff, but, um, I was just, mo I was really motivated because I, um, had the incredible luck of taking another course at the new school school on screenwriting. And it was taught by Mead Roberts who adapted Tennessee Williams plays for the screen, like summer and smoke and the fugitive kind. And he was brilliant. And I was so inspired by him. So, um, and he invited me into a writing group after that. And, you know, that just, everything sort of took off from there. So that's why I moved into screenwriting. Mm. I think it's fair to say that it's one thing to have a dream, a desire to do something. It's a whole other kettle of fish, so to speak, to actually start moving in that direction, to, to start making it happen. Mm -hmm. For yourself and, and this novel, Slow Reveal, what was it that made you 
start writing it, start creating it, rather than just have it be uh, a, a dream? Well, you know, I mean, it's not the first novel I've written. It just happens to be the one that gets published. But I, I um, for me, I... Some of it is about reconciling issues, um, whether it's within your own family or, you know, I, I, the thing that really fascinates me is, is, is how we have the, the opposing forces of um, trying to, to not distance ourselves from family, but to, you know, to create our own character in a sense. And then it, the opposing force is to, is, is to have more intimacy in that, in those relationships. And it, it's difficult. So I, I, I really wanted to explore that, but I wanted to do it, you know, around um, the creative arts. Slow reveal. This is your first published novel. Yeah. So why is it, do you think that this one basically hit, so to speak? <laughs> Good question. Um. It could be just the timing. It could be, uh, actually, I have to say that um, Canada is much more, the, the, lit, uh, the literary field in Canada is much more open to, to authors, um, independent authors. And it's motivated by, you know, the Canada Council on the Arts and, you know, it's supported by that uh, much more than the United States. And you, you can... You can navigate it without a literary agent. Um, you, um, you, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to make a living, which is an issue. But um, it, it's, I feel like it's, there's more, more opportunity there in that respect. Um, so that could be part of it. And part of it, it was, you know, I just wanted the art life, and I, I did um, – want other work to be published. But, you know, I, I, a lot of times I'm, my timing is off. Like I, you know, I write about something and then, you know, they say, oh, that would never happen. And then five years later it happens. It's just, you know, it, it's hard to explain why this particular novel hit, but it did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other novels are what, manuscripts? Yeah, they mm -hmm. are manuscripts. Do you think that once this once Slow Reveal has been out for a period of time, do you think that you will re-look at those past manuscripts and maybe send them sure. to your current publisher? Yeah, I mean, not not all of the manuscripts. There's just certain ones that I, I definitely feel have um, a strong possibilities. But I also am, you know, I'm always working on something new. And I, I started, a, you know, a new novel called The Expat um, that... I hope to put out there once yeah. I'm through the book process, you know, the publishing process. So you lived in, in New York city, mm -hmm. uh, especially back in the, the eighties, yeah. the nineties, uh, I believe in East village and Tribeca mm -hmm. uh, during, during those times you had, you know, the black ballroom culture voguing was happening. Andy Warhol in the eighties, you had places like CBGBs, you had punk music, mm -hmm. all happening in New York City. So what was it about this place that was such a nexus for the arts that would be so, so influential even today? What was it about, about New yeah. York City? I mean, that's, you know, that goes back to your question about why place it in the in the in 90s, the but it was like, you know, it, it, it was influenced by, you know, my experience in the 80s, too. Um, yeah, it was a very creative time for New York, the 80s. And it, but it was also very painful because of the AIDS crisis. So, um, uh, but artists could still afford to live there. I mean, albeit, you know, they were broke all the time, you know, just live to, to pay your rent and stuff. But, I mean, work to pay your rent. But there was... It was possible to live there as an artist, you know, and you didn't have to be a celebrity. And and I think that the the communities vary, whether it's gay community or um, the you know the creative community, that they you know they're very open to um, you know iconoclastic 
work and um, character, you know, and, and it, it just wasn't like about conforming to, to something. And, and I felt like that about a lot of places in the eighties, actually. Um, it, it was a time and, and it could be, you know, in, in the States, it could have been pushed back against Reagan. I don't know, but um, I, it, yes, it, it was a nexus and it still, it's, still has this, you know, sort of power that it doesn't get lost, even though New York really mm. changed. Do you have some, some uh, favorite memories of yours from, from back in, in, in that time frame? Well, you know, I, it, it was interesting because I had a few friends that um, ended up in New York that I knew from other places, which was sort of funny, but <laughs> Um, a lot of us ended up at uh, a bar called the pyramid and it was like a performance space in the East village. And it was just incredible what went down there. I mean, people, uh, this one uh, friend of mine had a group called disturbed form and it was music and also dance, but it was very abstract and, and very unusual. I mean, it, it, New York was, I mean, it, it was over the top, you know, people, this is where, you know, there's a character, my novel, Bridget, who <laughs> kind of personifies how crazy it was. But um, I, I think that, um, you know, you could just almost stay right in, it, it's like being in a little town, you know, you could stay in the East Village and have this whole life that was incredible. Um, so I, I think that that neighborhood really resonated for me too, because, you know, people were... Um, sort of taking control of the environment. It was, and, and there were little shops and restaurants, tiny little places that would pop up. Um, and people were just so innovative about, you know, how they did, how they ran their businesses and made art and even homesteaded buildings. You know, it was really a, a, an amazing time. So, Writing unleashes the imagination in ways that are inconceivable to the conscious mind. The element of surprise in the act of writing makes it all worthwhile. Is this some of your poetry? Um, no, it was just, you know, a, quote? a statement that I wanted to make about why I'm a writer and why I write, you know, and that it, it's it's almost like a transcendent state, you know, that you get in. And I, yes, that's, yeah, it's something that I have written. And you think that writing unleashes the imagination? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Are there aspects of your imagination that you think, uh, I don't think I want to go quite go there yet. Maybe a little too dark. Um, well, I, 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 Actually, I'm kind of on, tend to be on the dark side, so I'm not uncomfortable about going there. Um, it, it well, sometimes you you know there's you know there's always that voice in the back of your head saying, well, I don't know, you think anybody can handle this? But it, it's not so much me; it's it's more about uh, the character, you know, the character, or mm -hmm. or even like. The, the potential of, of a reader reacting to something. But I, I really don't write that way. I don't write a, to, to be read. I'm not conscious of that at all. But if it's something really controversial, um, you know, I have to think, is this going, you know, is this going to feel right? And, you know, so yes, it, you can go to dark places that way, but it's not all. Um, so, so you, you write, uh, screenplays uh novels do you uh, do you approach these writings in the same way or are they different do you approach them differently um yeah they're very different but you know it's interesting i, I really did one thing i learned in screenwriting that i actually use in prose uh, and fiction is um is building a history around my characters, you know, building, uh, you know, um, genealogy and, you know, going back a generation or whatever to get to know my characters better. And it's not something where it really, it all plays out in the work. It's just, it's, it's just gives layers to the characterization. And sometimes you find, you know, halfway through the novel that, 
you know, you look back over that, and you, you realize there's something really important that you, you could use, you know. So that, uh, those, that's, that's shared across medium. But um, generally, no, they're very different. Um, and actually, I've kind of been working more on fiction for some years than, than mm-hmm. screenwriting. So, yeah. Well, speaking about your your screenwriting, uh, some of them have been finalists at some film festivals. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and you you just mentioned that you know you're doing more more novel writing these days. Are you looking to potentially have slow reveal? Uh, maybe be a uh, a streaming series or uh, a film at some point? I'd love to adapt it. I mean, actually, you know, I have to say that wh- whatever novels I've written, I always, after they're done, I always have this fantasy about being able to adapt them to film. I mean, I know it's very different, um, but I, I envision, you know, uh, you know, that happening. Um so, yeah, I mean, I do have a fantasy about that. And, but, you know, I'd, I'd like to be the one to adapt it. But I think in general, if you even have a shot at it, you probably aren't going to be the one to adapt it. Um, although it takes, it, it takes a village <laughs> to get a film made. Um, An East but, Village. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an East Village, especially in this film. Yeah. Once, once audiences get a hold of this, they read it, they digest it. Is there a message that you want your audiences to take away once they've read Slow Reveal? Um, I do. I mean, I, as I mentioned before, I want them to understand more about the artistic process. Um, that sometimes having a passion can also be a curse. <laughs> um, be, because of, there's a lot of fallible thinking around um, you know, the, oh, you're so lucky you can sit around and make art all day. Um, so that's that's one of the uh, elements that I really want to to people to take away. Also, you can't dictate when and with whom you fall in love. And that can be quite messy. So I think people feel a lot of guilt around that, um, you know, depending on how it goes. Um, you know, if you're not free to fall in love and it happens. Um so I, I wanted to, I, I hope that, that people can take away, you know, as I mentioned before, that devotion and commitment aren't always the guardrails that keep a relationship on track. So that's, that's one aspect. And also um, ha- why we deceive ourselves and sabotage what we want most. That seems to be a human fallibility as well. You know, why, why do we do that? And we tend to do that. So why do you think we do that? Why do you think we tend to? I don't know. I don't have the answer to. I I didn't give you the answer in the novel. It's just the fact that we do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I I don't know why we do that. Um, It could. It could. I think a lot of it dates back to our our family histories too. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, depending on how that goes. Um, You mentioned this earlier that you like to write about family, family dynamics, family relationships. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is it about family structure and and family dynamics that intrigues you? Well, you know, I, I am very intrigued by the nature versus nurture aspect of, um, how much control do we have over our, uh, our our history, you know, and how it impacts our future relationships. How much control do we have over our behavior, our emotional heredity, not just our physical heredity, you know? And 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 that always dates back to family. Um, and and the fact that experience rarely matches expectations. And I think that we we find that out in our upbringing, you know. Um, so. And the same aspect of what I said, why we sabotage what we want most, that we really want to have an intimate relationship with our families. Um, But at the same time, we want to liberate ourselves from the psychological entrapment. So it's kind of a, 
conundrum, you know, and I, and I, I, I can endlessly write about that, you know, different families in different situations, but yeah, it's endless. And, and family dynamics in the LGBT community yes, is, is very complicated when, you know, mm-hmm. parents, you know, maybe even disown their, yeah their children because they come out as, you know, gay or lesbian or, or, you know, what have you. Mm-hmm. And those can be challenging family dynamics. Absolutely. And yeah. Very much so. And um, I know heartbreaking stories around that. And in the novels, <laughs> the opposite happens almost, where even though these, these kids are real, they're older and they're involved in everything, mm-hmm. they have a problem with, with their mother, you know, getting mm-hmm. into this relationship. So, um, yeah, it can work in several directions. <sighs> Melanie Mesner, I have to say thank you so much for your time. Well done, well said, well written. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Naomi tried on every jacket and every pair of pants hanging in her cramped closet. Her indecision had nothing to do with vanity, but in some perverse way, she would replace Jonathan at his own memorial service. Attending wasn't her idea. Catherine insisted on it. She needed her there, but never explained why. The macabre image of funerals as weekly tributes triggered that dreadful time in her life. She'd been to so many over the years for friends and artists who died of cancer and AIDS. They were her peers, just like Jonathan, not her elders. Death, unlike life, had become a close friend, intimate, dependable, remarkable in ways, someone she could trust, someone who reliably showed up only after a brief absence and never lacked enthusiasm for her own personal struggle. This, she said, dangling the leather harness she used to seduce Catherine, is completely inappropriate. Therefore, I will wear it fully accessorized. Her somber mood was broken by this crazy gesture, the inanity of it all. She imagined cutting through the crowd of mourners yelling, Thou art art, pointing to the urn of Jonathan's ashes. Cruel and unbecoming, yes, but honest. Why weren't people honest anymore? Have lies been told so often they now appeared absolute and irrefutable? She dropped the briefs she planned to wear, walked into the living room sporting her harness and over to the window where she pulled up the shades and yelled, Cocks and crows be damned, I stand before thee naked, a woman, a man, a monster and she cackled and crowed maddeningly before whisking a bottle off the cabinet, lifting the cork and guzzling it down, then spraying her woolen rug with a shower of ruby wine, rubbing it in for good measure with the heel of her bare foot. Sick and tired of the tidy lies, she fixated on the stain. There will be no more deception between us. In Catherine's absence, she could not dispute her claim. The act revitalized her, and her dynamism returned. She acknowledged the pulsating rhythm of her sex locked up in a harness, felt the energy bound up and turned inward. She wasn't fixed in a singular mindset about what makes a man, what makes a woman. To her, it was not the body or the genitals, but the orientation of energy. It hadn't been easy, not because of her identity, but because of her disorientation around gender like those little icons stuck on the walls of public toilets, indicating which door to use. She rarely interpreted the symbols correctly. They made no sense, which accounted for the way she often walked blindly into the wrong bathroom. As if there were no subtleties in the evolution of the human race, we must define, we must confine. She glanced at the clock over the kitchen stove and dashed into the bedroom to dress. If she didn't pull herself together, she'd be late for the memorial service. She wanted to be there on time, even though she knew her presence would probably make things worse. And she hated herself, their relationship for that. On Amazon.ca, Slow Reveal has a rating of five out of five stars. For even more on this novelist and screenwriter, Melanie Mesner, Dot com. I'm Sky Gilbert. 
and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Terra. Up next, singer, songwriter, and musician Will Carpenter joins me to talk about his band, Ships Have Sailed, and their 2022 album, Ages, which reached number nine on the U.S. alternative iTunes charts. I'm not as innocent as I used to be, and I probably care too much what you think of me. And it takes too much wine to put my mind at ease I know, I know But what if the whole wide world was looking up to me Hanging on every word of my philosophy Could I spend all my life trying to set them free I don't know I don't know So call out your message, your words Maybe you'll get to be heard Maybe get what you deserve Maybe this life ain't enough Maybe we're down on our luck And I will never give up All I know is we gotta stand Will Carpenter, hi, how are you? I'm doing really well. Uh, It's a great day. Uh, How are you, Mark? Thank you for the opportunity. I am good. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ships have sailed. This is your brainchild. This is your group, your musical group. Talk to me about uh, your band, your group, Ships Have Sailed. And in, in regards to the style of music that you guys do, that you do. Yeah, so Ships Have Sailed is, like you said, it's my artist project. It is a passion project. I really only create under Ships Have Sailed when the song really means something to me personally. Um, And I also like to keep the um, the genre options open. Um, And we are very thankful to have a very uh, open-minded fan base who embraces that about us. So as far as genre wise, uh, it's in a nutshell, I call it indie rock with a poptimistic angle. So crossing pop and optimism. Um, But really we stretch all over the indie genre. So from pop to rock to singer songwriter, sometimes Americana sometimes leaning a little bit more electro and cinematic these days and pretty much like everything in between, like anything that you can imagine in all of those combinations. So Ages, this is your current album. It's an album reached number nine on the U.S. alternative iTunes charts. Amazing. Completely unbelievable hearing you say (laughs) that. And when I said it and saw it for the first time, also unbelievable. You have a top 10 album, honey. How does that make you feel? I mean... It's that's that's the dream, right? I mean, um, just very, very thankful to everybody who supported us by pre-ordering it, because I I really think that it is our diehard fans who pre-ordered the record that are responsible for that chart position. hundred percent.
Broken Hearts. This is one of your singles. Yes. Featured on CBS's legal drama, Bull. Yeah. Congrats on that. Talk to me about that specifically. How did you end up getting uh, your your single, Ships of Sales single, Broken Hearts, on CBS on Bull? Yeah, uh, that it is... It probably was not an easy task. No, I mean, like, nothing... <laughs> Nothing in this in this world is easy, um, specifically in entertainment. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you that. Um, you know, you have been building up your own platform and your own following, and so you know, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm t- talking about. It's all it's all a journey, and it's an uphill uh, struggle. You know, and you have to be prepared to kind of do that every day. And I think the bowl placement was. You know, a lot of people, a lot of artists these days are pursuing sync licensing, which is kind of the technical term for what happens when when your song lands in a movie or a TV show or an ad. Um, it's synchronizing the audio to the to the visual media. And so that's the technical term for it. And a lot of artists are really pursuing that heavily right now because it's a it's a pretty decent source of income or it can be if you build up your um, your contacts and start seeing traction in that space. Um, I guess what I'll say is that over the past few years, we have also been kind of trying to be a little bit better about our networking and our, our contacts in that area, making sure that we're sending playlists to supervisors that we think are relevant based on the projects that they're working on. Um, and you know, we've seen some some great conversations and some growing relationships build out of that. In the case of Bull and Broken Hearts, I really think, number one, of course, your music has to be in the right inbox, but I really think that that scene was perfect for the song and not the other way around. I think, um, you know, obviously our song was up against probably five or six others because that's just how it works. And they're looking at them all cut to that same scene and trying to determine which one is the best. And for some reason, the first verse of our song wound up pairing with what the main character was processing in the, in that very moment in a way that I'm, I'm guessing the others did not. And so it was largely a matter of luck, I would say. And then just the idea that we had targeted this, this supervisor knowing that he was working on this show and actually not knowing that that scene existed. Um, And it all happened really fast. We got a quote request. um, And then three weeks later, which was like two days before the show aired, we got to confirm that it was in the mix and, um, you know, scrambled to set up a release plan because we weren't actually planning to release that song last year. Um, and so, yeah, but super thankful for that opportunity. It was, it was really amazing to see it play such a pivotal role in such a powerful scene. And, um, again, you know, this is, this is, part of what we of what we do it for is for those little moments of gratification both the industry gratification but then also kind of like you know the personal gratification individual emails that that come in people sharing their stories about loss because that song spoke to them after discovering it through that show i mean like it they still come into these to this day because people consume media a little bit differently these days so Some people are just discovering it now, and um, it's really, really cool. So what's coming up next for you for Ships of Sailed? We basically, we shut ourselves in a friend's studio for four days, and we recorded a a live show, like an album release show. Um, And we we did it, we pre-recorded it only because the streaming quality is going to be way better that way and the sound quality is going to be way better. And we want to... Did you um, film this? Yeah, we want to make it a gr- like a really great experience. So as much as we have already recorded it, we're working on edits right now, and we're about to schedule the um, 
the the date of the stream we really wanted it to be something that everybody could enjoy at a high quality. And so we decided to kind of do it um, the pre-recorded, like pre-filmed studio route, as opposed to just kind of getting in a room with acoustic instruments. So I'm really excited about that. I think it, uh, you know, from, from what I'm seeing, it turned out better than what we had anticipated. So I'm really, really proud of what we were able to accomplish in just a few days. And, um, you know, I'm really excited for folks to see it. We're going to be kind of like, in the chat and um, we are partnering with Moment House to do the stream and they have this really cool thing called rooms where you can like engage with with folks in small groups likely after the performance. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna make it a whole event and do it kind of as a virtual release show and it's gonna be really fun. I have to say Will Carpenter, thank you so much for your time. Well said, well done, and well made. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm glad to see that you are still doing your thing. Ships Have Sailed virtual album release show will be broadcast via Moment House on Sunday, June 12th, 12 noon, Pacific Time. For more information, momenthouse.com slash ships have sailed. Hi, I'm songwriter and producer Jim Valance, and you are listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. And just like that, this little gay journey through Rainbow Country has come to an end. For the full two-hour episode, head over to marktar.com where everything is connected and hit the archives banner. To keep up to date with the show, follow me on socials at marktara. The podcast is available on all major platforms, including audible.com and iHeartRadio. And finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, stay well, stay safe, and believe in yourself. Hi, this is Police Constable Danielle Botno, also known as LGBT Cop, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Terra. Mm.